So today let's explore a failed LED lamp. And I guess this one is from a little supermarket. And it didn't last very long. It lasted for about 1000 hours or one year. It would be a typical life for a tungsten lamp, but quite a short life for an LED. A lot of compact fluorescent lamps I installed 10 years ago are still working and linear fluorescent tubes I installed 20 years ago are still working. This one says 12 watts, 2700 Kelvin, 58 milliamps, 230 volts, 50 hertz, E27 bias. And let's try to test it using this test socket and it flickers, it's intermittent and it's not a poor contact in the bias. The intermittence is inside of the lamp. I guess there's time to open it. Let's try this one. It was easy. There is five LEDs in it, warm white ones. Can I remove this somehow? Or? It actually says 2016, but I've bought it, put it somewhere for several years and then I finally got to install it. It was not installed for that long. It was probably about one or two years in service. And it actually feels very heavy for the size, so I expect a good quality, but it failed anyway. Not sure how I remove this. It seems to be pressed in. This is one part of the heat sink and the other part is probably a cone inside of it. This is definitely not going to be reversible. And that's it. And it's actually in a resin. The entire power supply is in some rubbery soft resin here. This is really not meant to be repaired. Can I also remove this? Or maybe the poor contact is in this bias. Maybe it would be fixable before opening it from this side. But anyway, the point is to analyze it, not to fix it. One contact should be somewhere here. I can actually see a burn mark here. I guess the poor contact was actually between this wire and this shell. The metal shell is just pushing against the wire, but it does not ensure a good contact. And it also smells of something burning, or not really burning, but smells of arcing. And removing this, and it reveals some resistors. One of them fell apart. And there are two resistors, probably fusible resistors, and their wires were actually used as the connections to the tip and the shell. One came off. Was it a poor solder joint, or did I break it here? I don't think it was a poor solder joint. I broke it when trying to pull the resistors out of this resin and the poor contact was actually on the other side of the resistor, between the wire and the shell. Can I push this one out? It comes out. They used a lot of resin here. At least it's a soft one. Let's solder the resistor back. And I guess when I try to test it now, it will work. And it's working. No intermittence now. Until you accidentally short something, of course. Of course the crocodile clips shorted, what else would you expect? And now let's explore it. It has the two resistors going into a bridge rectifier. Then there are some capacitors here. And a big capacitor parallel to the LEDs. No big electrolytic capacitor after the bridge rectifier. Just smaller capacitors. So I guess this one has to have a good power factor and might also be dimmable. Let's give it one more try and let's try to measure the voltage on the LEDs. Of course now I'm completely blind. And it says 58.4 volts on all the LEDs in a series. And this looks like four chips in each of five packages. That's 20 LED junctions and each of them about 2.9 volts voltage drop. But now let's try to reverse engineer it. Removing the resin and the heat shrink on the capacitor is falling apart. 
it's a 100 volt capacitor, 150 micro. So this one definitely isn't after the bridge rectifier. This is after some sort of a buck regulator. This looks like a transformer, but it has three pins. These two are connected and this one doesn't go anywhere. It's just for mechanical support, I guess. Here's the board and it seems to be using a discrete transistor here. A lot of LED lamps are using a chip with a built-in high voltage switching transistor, but this one has an external transistor. And of course the LED wires just fell off and a 125 degrees Celsius electrolytic capacitor. Ex boom LED TA. Interesting capacitor. This is not easy to reverse engineer. I will probably have to destroy it in the process, remove the transformer to see under it and cut some connections to measure the components. So before this let's measure the waveform on the inductor. Let's measure the waveform now before it all falls apart. All the components and wires keep falling off and I have to keep soldering it back. Can I get some reading here? Turning it on. No explosion, just my multimeter turning off automatically after some time, which is also annoying. Making contact with the inductor. Of course now it's, it's 2 times 10 probe, but this one is 100 times. It doesn't have a setting for this, so we have to multiply the voltages by 10. Now setting the lowest sensitivity, I guess, is the right way. Still too much. I guess the LEDs are going to bake themselves before I make a connection here. The tape doesn't actually stay on it. And it seems like there is a ripple. Yes, there is a 100 Hz ripple because it has no smoothing. For good power factor or to be dimmable. And when I zoom it in, here is some switching. And of course I'm showing a very bad example of how to treat minus voltage here, but you probably don't see much on the oscilloscope anyway. And of course it's not isolated from mains, so I'm using a battery powered oscilloscope, which is not grounded, not referenced to mains. And I'm also not referenced to mains, so I can also basically touch one of the terminals of the mains. If I don't touch both, it doesn't do anything, as long as I'm not touching ground. If you touch just one and there is no return path to ground, you don't get a shock, but I strongly recommend you not to do this. And let's try to actually measure it once more. I soldered the wire onto the point I couldn't hook this one and now I can actually show it better to you. Does it synchronize? It actually synchronizes now. And the amplitude is jumping up and down because the switching circuit is running on an unsmooth voltage. When I zoom it way out, you can actually see the envelope, 100 Hz. And when I zoom it in, it seems it's running at a variable frequency and constant on time. The frequency is jumping 40 kHz, 90 kHz. The lower the voltage coming from the bridge rectifier, the higher the frequency and also a higher duty cycle because at a higher frequency and a constant on time, higher frequency means higher duty cycle. Let's keep pressing the stop button. Now I stopped it when minus was near peak and it's about 41 kilohertz. 95 kilohertz. This is near the zero crossing. There is not much smoothing, just very little smoothing from the film capacitors, polyester or polypropylene probably, which have a low capacitance. So during zero crossing the voltage falls to just a small fraction of the peak voltage. Is there a chance of reading the marking on the chip? I put a white heatsink compound on it. I desoldered the inductor and the only way to see the traces is to shine a torch through it. And here's the full schematic of it, which wasn't easy to reverse engineer. I even cut some connections to measure the SMD capacitors on it, that have no markings and of course can't be measured in circuit. And also measuring the inductors using my DIY inductance meter, which displays the value on a multimeter. And this one measured at 20 millihenry range per 200 millivolts. The closest standard value is 3.9 millihenry. And now let's explore the schematic. The mains comes in here through these inrush limiting fusible resistors. Here's the metal oxide varistor for over voltage protection. The bridge rectifier. Some capacitors but low capacitances. Not for smoothing but for high frequency decoupling and interference suppression as well as this interference suppression inductor and its dampening resistor. One of the capacitors also has a dampening resistor it seems, and there is a 400 volt zener for over voltage protection. And then the pulsing DC voltage goes into this circuitry. It's actually not a buck regulator, but an inverting regulator. Note that the negative of the bridge rectifier goes into the positive of the main LED capacitor. So this LED terminal is negative in reference to this common zero volt rail. This capacitor has a discharging resistor here. And also the common zero volt rail of the chip, the pin 2, 
is not connected to this common zero volt rail of the rectified mains. That's because the transistor is switching in the positive, not in the negative. So the chip common negative is floating with the source of the transistor as it's switching. The pin 1 through this resistive divider is sensing the voltage on this inductor, which when the transistor is off is almost the same as the voltage on the LEDs. It's probably a protection against open LEDs so it doesn't overcharge this capacitor. Pin 3 is unused, pin 4 is basically switching it here. When it pulls the source of the transistor down, then the gate is positive in reference to it and the transistor turns on. It does not actually control the gate, it seems that the gate is connected to a DC voltage, because it has quite a high capacitance capacitor on it, 2.2 micro. So the pin 4 is an output which has full current switching capability, but not the full voltage switching capability, and that's why it has this high voltage transistor rated 600 volts. Pin 5 is the current sensing, which goes through this resistor, but the data sheet shows a straight connection here, and the current sensing resistors are actually here, a parallel combination. And the pin 6 is the positive of the chip, and in the data sheet, these resistors actually go to this, as startup resistors, but in this case the resistors really go here for some reason. And this pin is just decoupled via a capacitor, and this pin is the voltage sensing, and this is probably also necessary because it's dimmable. I guess it senses the average voltage here and regulates the current of the LEDs accordingly. There is basically a sensing divider and this low pass filter capacitor. And the transistor has about 22 picofarad snubber capacitor, but it's not easy to measure such low values. This one is also a bit tricky to measure. And of course the schematic probably looks bloody confusing. But let's try to highlight the current paths in it when the transistor is on and when it's off. Let's begin with the condition when it's on. The current goes through the transistor, it goes into this pin of the chip, through the chip, through here, through the inductor and into the negative. And that's the current path when the transistor is on and the polarity of the voltage on this inductor is this. And when the transistor turns off the polarity of the voltage on the inductor flips, but the current in it still flows the same direction. Now the current actually goes into the capacitor, charges the capacitor and also powers the LEDs, goes through this ultra-fast diode, the current sensing resistors, and through here. When the transistor is on, the inductor accumulates energy, and when the transistor is off, the inductor releases the energy and puts it into the capacitor and the LEDs. And the reason they are using an inverting regulator instead of a buck regulator is that a buck regulator can only operate when the input voltage is higher than the output voltage. But an inverting regulator can operate both when the input voltage is higher or lower than the output voltage. And this allows it to operate even when it's running on a triac regulation set to a very low level. And also improves the power factor because it can still draw some current from mains even close to zero crossing. Well, maybe a small correction, when the transistor is on, it actually goes through here and into the pin 5, so it goes through this sensing resistor and then like this. The internal switching transistor goes from pin 4 to pin 5, so it can actually go through the sensing resistor here. Now it's properly confusing, isn't it? And of course using my calculator to calculate the parallel combination of the two resistors and they produce about 0 0.8 ohms. So that's how this LED lamp works or worked. And it would probably work for many more years if there wasn't the poor contact. LED lamps very often fail because of a poor contact or bad solder joint, not a failing component. That's it and if you like my videos please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. This channel wouldn't be possible without you.